We need to basically hand developers a grab bag of intuitive tools that give them no excuse not to use these tools as they're developing code. We need a spell check. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning back into The Secure Developer. Nicole, really excited to, to have you here with us on the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank uh, you so much, Guy. I'm excited to be here. Nicole, we all know now <laughs> that you've sort of written this uh, this great book. Uh, this is how they tell me the world ends. You know, quite a riveting uh, read or listen for me. I sort of listen to it. Um, for those who are not familiar with it, you know, haven't read it yet, tell us uh, a little bit about what the book is about. Sure. So the book is really about this race to the bottom that we have been in with cybersecurity. And the title came to me in the shower one day and just sort of stuck. It's a little bit about my own journey in learning about the threat landscape and our vulnerability. It comes from the point of view of someone who had very little technical expertise and was essentially thrown into the deep end of the pool onto the cybersecurity beat at the New York Times during what would become one of the most consequential decades for cybersecurity when threats really moved from you know, identity scam, spam, you know, the occasional high profile DDoS attack to this post Stuxnet era and this recognition from every country under the sun that they could use code, not just for espionage, but for destruction. And the goal of the book was really to wake up not the technical community. You know, people in this industry have known for a very, very long time uh, what the stakes were here but to wake up the non-technical community and to say, hey, this is not really just a technical problem mm -hmm. anymore. This is a societal problem. This is a culture problem. This is a leadership problem. This is a policy problem. And this is an awareness problem. And it's time that all of you uh, learn what's been happening and, and the trade-offs we've been making on cybersecurity in the name of everything else, whether it was cost savings or convenience or even national security, you know, old thinking of national security we were sacrificing cybersecurity for. So that's the book. So the book is full of of stories that are interesting, although not always like, uh, <laughs> you know, you're not always happy to sort of hear that they've happened, but they're sort of uh, the riveting, even as a techie and even as someone in cyber, there's still uh, some newness, you know, not not as much as I would like, you know, when, uh, when listening to it, it kind of gets dark at times, right, in terms of all these stories. Did you, did you have a moment where you sort of wondered, you know what, <laughs> maybe I don't want to really like uh, continue exploring here or like were there uh, crisis moments in that front? There were a lot of crisis moments. It took me seven years to do this book. And it's not that it took me seven years to you know, write 400 pages or whatever it is. There was a lot of writer's block involved. And I think some of that was fear related to the subject matter. I think some of it was imposter's complex, sort of how dare I this non-technical woman journalist tell this story. And I think there was a lot of fear that because I was a non-technical female New York Times mainstream journalist telling this story, I was definitely scared of the Twitter blowback that I knew would inevitably <laughs> follow. But interestingly, I never thought, oh, I need to stop because I'm afraid of nation state hackers coming for me or I am scared of what will happen if I expose these highly classified programs, offensive programs within government. It was really more about how is this going to land with the cybersecurity community? And I think at a certain point, I just had to put them out of my head and remind myself, I'm not writing it for the, the community that already knows and has mm -hmm. known for a long time what's been happening in this space. I'm writing it for my mom. I'm writing it for Senator Klobuchar. I'm writing it for someone who might have some vague notions of what's going on in this space. You know, maybe they've read my articles every now and then, but they don't really know how we got here. And they don't really know our own government's role in how we got here. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand that this is not nuclear. You know, this is not a situation where just because you're on the top and you have the top weapons in the space, your adversaries won't get there. It's really a space where there's a low barrier to entry 
and the gap between the cyber superpowers and everyone else was closing much quicker than yeah. I think anyone in the intelligence community certainly gave them credit for. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I, I did the book, but I'll tell you that actually the publisher, my original publisher canceled on me um, really? about two years before the book came out. And I had to go out and resell the book. Everyone turned me down except for one editor at Bloomsbury, uh, Anton Muller, who said, I, I just want it as is. I don't want to change the title. I don't want to change a single <laughs> word. I see that this book needs to get out there and I will do whatever it takes to get you across the finish line. And thank God that that happened. And I I even got a, a note from the old publisher sort of saying, wow, we, we really screwed up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good thing for you for uh, persevering here. And I guess it's like J.K. Rowling has some, uh, you know, famously, uh, you know, got turned yeah. down by sort of, you know, some 50, 60, 70 uh, publishers before. And guess what? My publisher was her publisher, Bloomsbury. <laughs> the only one <laughs> who took up on it is the yeah. only one up on it so that's some good uh yeah. good insight you know if they sort of the the repetition uh the repetition of there and, and i think um you know I, I again i found the book very interesting but also i feel it actually is i, I think quite relevant to to people in the technical community yeah. you know sometimes uh you know maybe if you're sort of not technical by the way you know technical people get twitter blowback all the time uh, <laughs> as well but uh um but i i think a lot of the problem of security is that it's invisible. It doesn't have a natural feedback loop. You don't really know that you're not doing it right, that you're sort of uh, causing problems. And like it or not, one of the ways of raising awareness and raising, you know, how much people care to look is to sort of understand the cautionary tales, understand the, the what ifs. And it's hard when you hear about a hack that happened to corporation, other, it's not you, there's a lot of like, it won't happen here. And I feel like part of what the book does is, you know, it talks about geopolitical impact of, sort of cyber espionage and sort of cyber warfare. You know, you can't really say this doesn't affect me. Uh, and and so I do think that it, uh, you do need to sort of touch home sometimes. And, and I think it achieves, uh, achieves a lot of that. Yeah, I think that was definitely my takeaway over the last 10 years. And I think it was one that when I went to the person that I call the godfather of cyber war in the United States, this character, um, Jim Gossler, who's a, a real hero, considered a real hero in the intelligence community. He emphasized this point over and over again. You know, if he didn't think that I was paying attention, <laughs> he would state it again. He would say, Nicole, no, I need to repeat this. You can never be fully sure that a system doesn't have vulnerabilities. And it goes back to this famous speech by, I it was Ken Thompson, Reflections on Trusting Trust that he gave mm -hmm. in the 60s, where he said, unless you've written the code yourself, you can never be fully confident that it doesn't contain a backdoor. And what Jim Gossler said to me was, think of where we are. Well, think of where we are now with global supply chains. Not only do you not write the code, you don't make the chips, you know, you're not overseeing the factory. In fact, a lot of these factories are in countries that we would call adversaries like China that are some of the most prolific backers of, of state-sponsored hacking and cyber espionage. And, and yeah. so it's just this huge wake-up call um, that, you know, even the people who are at the top of their game don't trust anything. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you mentioned the reflections on trusting trust. I, uh, I had a talk at QCon a few years ago titled uh, Developer as a Malware Distribution Vehicle. Not as good as your title, but I was fond of it at the time. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, talk about but that an Xcode goes, then today, you know, the world is full of malicious component examples. So indeed, you know, let's, uh, you know, th there's a lot of sort of good reason to kind of bring you on here and uh, and share the stories with uh, uh, with the audience. But specifically, I think, you know, an area that, you know, touches home to some people listening here uh, is the whole world of supply chain security. And indeed, you know, uh, uh, software produced by, you know, one entity, maybe consumed by another. Before, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about maybe the intricacies and what can we do about this. But maybe let's start with some stories. You've come across, you know, quite a few of those over here. Can you sort of share a few examples from the book or not around supply chain security and how it indeed plays into the geopolitical cyber warfare world? I think, you know, the biggest supply chain security moment in recent times was solar winds. You know, this this attack that I'm sure your audience is familiar with, but just in case they've been um, hiding in a cave somewhere for the last couple of years, you know, this attack. Uh, conducted by Russia's SVR intelligence agency's hackers that essentially hijacked 
the uh, software update from SolarWinds, which was a Texas company uh, that marketed itself as a security company, a visibility software, you know, software that essentially lets you see what's on your network. And they hijacked the software update. So everyone who did what you're all told we're all supposed to do is keep our software up to date, patch, et cetera. Um, you know, when they downloaded the latest SolarWinds uh, software update, they were instead getting a Russian Trojan horse. And we now know that Russia used that access to potentially breach you know, some of our most critical government agencies like the Treasury Department, the Department of Justice, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, the very agency mm -hmm. charged with keeping us safe in this realm, Department of Energy, even some of the nuclear labs used solar winds. What struck me at the time was that once this was disclosed, and by the way, it wasn't disclosed by the NSA you know, or the top hackers in government who for years had been saying, we have a, a policy of defend forward, active defense. So long mm -hmm. as we're walking into foreign networks, into the SVR systems, into Russia systems, we'll have this early alert system. Yeah, maybe yeah. We'll know, you know what they're up over Overconfidence over there in the- uh, Little in the overconfidence, sentiment. right. And this attack really exposed our blind spot because they staged it at servers inside the United States where the NSA can't look. It was only discovered because Mandiant or FireEye discovered that they had bre been breached and out of the goodness of their own hearts disclosed that breach. It, it didn't touch PII, you know, personally identifiable information, which would have triggered state data breach notification laws. So they they raised the red flag and, and thank God that they did. Then in rewinding the tape discovered, okay, this started with uh, the update that we did from solar winds and, and we're able to flag that for for solar winds and for everyone else but otherwise you know we might not have ever known yeah. about this breach and they were inside our systems I believe for as long as nine months before anyone knew about it but the final thing I'll say about solar winds is what was stunning to me as a reporter was calling up all of these companies listed and government agencies listed on solar winds website as customers and trying to confirm you know that they had been impacted or, or were at least in the process of trying to forensically understand whether they had been impacted. And half of them didn't even know that they had been using solar winds, let alone that solar winds had been you know, really under investing in their own security for a long time, that they were now owned by a private equity firm who'd been cost cutting, has, was essentially now run by an accountant, and that most of the build code uh, was, was done in Poland, which is you know, Poland, but also Belarus, not exactly, um, you know, a friendly. So, you know, it just shined this huge light on our blind spots in the supply chain, in the code itself, in, um, you know, the NSA's ability to actually look for this stuff, sort of the, the overconfidence of, of our offensive strategy in being all we needed to defend ourselves. And I think since then, we've only had more and more wake up calls. You know, the log for shell issue last December, where we learned that this critical um, open source uh, protocol, as you'd call it, uh, was was basically a giant vulnerability. And, and there too, it was, we only learned about it because an employee at Alibaba defied new national security laws in China to flag it for everyone. And actually Alibaba paid uh, dearly as a result. I believe the Chinese Communist Party ended up suspending some of their government contracts because a couple oh. years ago, they, uh, they put in place this new law saying, if you find a critical vulnerability, a zero day, you must give the state uh, first notice. You can't go out to the, the broader market, which is what this um, Chinese engineer had done. And thank God he did, because as a result, we all learned just how vulnerable these systems are. We're still learning, right? I think Jen Easterly has called it the most critical vulnerability uh, she has seen in her in her career. So you know, over and over again, this just keeps happening yeah. and uh, we can't ignore it any longer. Yeah. So both are indeed, uh, you know, kind of key stories, I guess, kind of the, the poster children uh, now for sort of uh, supply chain security uh, concerns on it. And I guess uh, maybe a question more from like the, the media lens on it. Log for Shell was interesting because, you know, for a moment it was sort of top news uh, on on mainstream media sites, you know, for, I say a moment, because I feel like I don't know if it was even a day, it was top news, but and it felt maybe there was an appreciation for the seriousness of the moment. 
they made it. But then pretty instantly, you know, I think definitely by the next day, it was nowhere to be found. It was like may maybe buried somewhere in the sort of the tech uh, sort of pages of the of the paper. I mean, how do you think about that? Like, do you think there is kind of popular appetite to hear about these things, to hear about these concerns? Is there like what needs to happen <laughs> for something yeah. to uh, to stay in sort of the consumer awareness, sort of the, the people's awareness for more than a few uh, a few moments? Yeah, I mean, you could extrapolate that generally to so many different things. There are so many news items. You know, shootings, mass shootings, Uvalde, Texas, that I I mourn the fact they're not front page news still, even you know, this many weeks or months later. How are we still not talking about this? How are we, how have we all just seemingly moved on? It's incredibly frustrating, I think, just as a citizen. Um, security, cybersecurity, it's even worse <laughs> because it is a technical topic. It's an intimidating topic for a lot of people. And I will say that the hardest part of my job, actually, the hardest part of my job at the New York Times was Twitter. You know, being a female journalist on Twitter, working for the New York Times, you are going to have a target on your back. Yeah. It's not really ugly. Very cool. yeah. But the second hardest part of my job at the New York Times was the um, badgering <laughs> <laughs> I would have to do to try to get some of these major cybersecurity stories, in my opinion, on the front page, you know, convincing the masthead, listen, I know that this is technical. We have to put this on the front page and we have to follow up tomorrow and we probably have to do a longer deep dive and it probably won't be ready for a week or two when everyone has moved on, but this is so important. We need to make sure that this sticks. And sometimes I was successful and sometimes I wasn't. And I do think that it is too bad that we had incidents like Y2K, you know, where there was just this a lot crazy, of noise. Yeah. A lot of noise. Um, and then nothing really seemed to happen. Now we learn later that actually some serious things uh did happen in the in the periphery, but nothing that really made its way yeah, into not of the magnitude of of what sort of it was made up to be. Yeah. Right, exactly. And I and that's a huge balance. That was probably the hardest challenge of my third hardest challenge of my job is how do you walk this tightrope between whoa waving hands hey this is really important look over here and okay let's not create panic that's actually why i ended up doing the book was because i would parachute into these situations whether it was log for shell i was just out of the new york times when that happened so i didn't cover it but you know heartbleed solar winds um APT attacks, you know, what the U.S. was doing, I'd parachute into these situations and um, so much was happening at once and almost simultaneously that you're jumping around. It's hard to hold people's attention. And I realized, wow, I, I think this really needs someone to, to step back and, and to hold the reader by the hand, um, the non-technical readers too, and walk them through the space almost in chronological order and make it entertaining. You know, just technical accuracy is critical, but make it hold their attention long yep. enough to say, hey, these things are all connected and there is a through line here and it's pretty ugly where it's going. And yep. so it's time for all of us to sort of pay attention and, and, and connect the dots here. And so that was that I would say had my book in the end, I feel like had far greater impact in holding attention spans than any one article I did at the New York Times. Well, and I guess there's people come in and you get a chance to sort of build up a bit of their knowledge, you know, amidst the story and included versus the sort of the brief attention span of a, of a story. What you're describing here sounds uh, awfully similar to sort of developer security training programs that have been successful. You know, we had teams from uh, from Segment, you know, now with Twilio, for instance, talking about how it's important to get real world vulnerabilities that happen in their systems into the training that happens to, you know, that they give to their developers because otherwise people generally like have a hard time engaging, you know, they have a hard time uh, uh, staying, uh, staying focused and remembering and retaining information. So I think it's um, in, in within the 
sort of software world, I think it's at this point fairly accepted that the whole notion of a culture of security and having people sort of understand that security matters uh, and care about security, you know, they, they often sort of, you know, push back when we talk about developer securities, people say, well, developers don't care about security, right? And you have to, um, uh, you, you know, dispel that and, and, and sort of get developers engaged. Is that also true from a societal perspective? I mean, can we address the gravity of this concern without getting public appreciation for it can the or or is that sort of a necessity to get these stories stick around or arrive on the sort of front page a bit more often just stepping back a bit so i think we've been on this collision course certainly while i was at the new york times and probably before when i was at forbes just covering the startup scene in general. We've been on this collision course between what Mark Zuckerberg articulated as move fast and break things and what Mark Andreessen articulated as software eats world. Um, you know, these things that, you know, move fast, like just, it doesn't have to be perfect. Speed is is critical. That is the enemy of security. Speed has always been the enemy of security. And so what do we do? to remind the developer to essentially slow down and fix their shit, which I point out in at Facebook now, where there used to be graffiti that said, move fast and break things. The last time I visited, it said, slow down and fix your shit. <laughs> so there is certainly the awareness has trickled down at Facebook. What's called written in blood, right? Like sort of a, right. in a, exactly. you know, based on a, based on historical learnings. Yes. Like there's a point where I thought about you know, making my gravestone say, slow down and <laughs> fix your shit. <laughs> no, I think the best example of how to hammer this home is what Google now does. When you are a new hire at Google, I believe they still do this. I hope they still do this. Heather Adkins, um, who's you know headed up their information security, walks you through the Aurora attack, the 2009 attack by a Chinese APT on Google. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you fit into the organization, whether you're a developer or you work in you know completely non-technical sales office somewhere. Doesn't matter. They'll tell you the story about how someone in their Beijing office at the time was convinced to click on a link. And I believe then it was their America Online Instant Messenger, or MSN Instant Messenger in those days, whatever the you know, Slack uh, predecessor was mm -hmm. in those days. And how that translated to dissidents' email accounts getting hacked. And I think what's so powerful about that story is that, hey, wake up. It starts with you. You click on one spear phishing link. You know, it's not, it doesn't happen anymore because Google, I think, epitomizes zero trust now as an organization. But um, you click on this one spear phishing link, you could get someone killed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not that hard of a stretch. It's not that far of a stretch. That is our only way out is that kind of storytelling to everyone in the organization. You know, when I interviewed Bob Lord as he was leaving the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, after the 2020 election, I said, what did you do to keep this, the DNC from getting a repeat uh, instance of what happened in 2016? And he said, it was really hard. You know, I did not have the budget I had for security at Yahoo or, or before that at Twitter. We have operatives everywhere. You know, this is like a really hard to defend organization that is an extremely high target, right? You can't deny it's a target. Mm -hmm. We all saw what happened with John Podesta's you know, risotto recipe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Something as seemingly innocuous as risotto become weaponized in an election. Yes. So, I said, how'd you do it? And he said, I wish I could tell you there was like a, a magic... Uh, algorithm. But what it was, was the organization made it a priority. They told me that I had, you know, five, 10 minutes at every single all hands meeting to use however I wish, but basically to hammer home the criticality of information security and cyber hygiene. He put a checklist on the back of the men's, uh, you know, women's bathroom, men's urinal that had a big Bob Moji on it. And it said, you know, have you turned on MFA? Are you using Signal for your most sensitive co uh, communications? Have you done the latest software update? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, are you using hardware uh, MFA keys? And he said he, that's what he credited was basically putting a Bob Moji above the urinal and saying like, don't forget 
you know, you too. It's almost like the um, Smokey the Bear, you know, equivalent uh, for forest fires. It's just someone reminding you, don't throw your cigarette out the window. Like you play a very critical role in preventing the next forest fire. And as weird and, and soft as that sound sounds, we we absolutely need to address the human behavior element to this problem. Why? You know, because how did Colonial Pipeline get breached? It got breached because one employee whose account they never deactivated had a crappy password. You know, how did Equifax get get hacked? They got hacked through, I believe it was a vulnerability in, what was it, Apache? In a, a Struts, uh, Apache Struts, like an open source Java library. Right. right. Um, you know, it, it, a, a mistake in the code, right? Is that is that too simplistic? Uh, no, it's okay. It's a bug, a security <laughs> bug. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's user error. You know, we think of this as a technical problem, but at the end of the day, it's really user error. And the only way to address user error is to convince the user to care about this. And the only way I know how to convince people to care about it is either to hack them myself. <laughs> Everyone always seems to get religion after they get hacked. You know, you only turn on MFA after your Instagram account gets taken over, whatever it is. Or you tell them the story, the really bad story about Colonial Pipeline or Aurora or your friend that got hacked and what happened in the aftermath. That's the only way I know how. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's interesting. It's, it's always... Uh, it's the constant debate, right, in security, because on one hand, if you, you know, maybe it's like to your example about Y2K, right, if you, uh, you know, kind of yell wolf on a regular basis, and most of the time, so well, they keep telling me I need to do this, but look, it's been five years I've been doing this and nothing happened, probably nothing will happen in the sort of the next five years is a constant concern, right? And sort of alert fatigue. So I guess the balance is always between constant uh, mindfulness and awareness and desensitization, you know, of saying, well, you keep telling me about it, but you're just spreading fear or because whatever it serves your purpose or your sort of agenda and you're not, it's not real. But I guess the more concrete and the more kind of close to home it is, uh, the more people will get into the uh, the religion, you know, as you point out, everybody gets religious after, uh, after their hack. Uh, Right. Hopefully, hopefully we find slightly better approaches <laughs> over uh, over time. I, I'd love to sort of talk a little bit about observations that you have uh, coming into the industry from 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 outside, actually, because you're maybe, you know, not technical and you're looking at it. Sometimes, you know, we get blinded to it a bit inside. Um, but before I do that, I just just before we leave the uh, the stories uh, uh, side a bit, I'd be remiss if I don't ask you about uh, about Ukraine. You know, I know you're sort of not, you know, uh, at the New York Times at the moment, but Phil, from what you sort of see, have you seen sort of cyber warfare or specifically supply chain kind of play a role? Um, you know, there's, there seems to have been sort of a sense of almost, uh, I don't want to, I don't know if I want to say disappointment, but there was like maybe uh, uh, expectation that there, there would be more visible uh, blowouts uh, on the space from uh, from Russia's force doing it. Any, any thoughts on what's happening over there? What do you heard? So, you know, in some ways, my book was prescient in that it starts in Ukraine after the 2017 not Petch mm -hmm. So when the invasion started, I was getting a lot of great questions, very positive, affirming, validating questions like, how did you know to start this in Ukraine? And did you know this, this would happen? And now the question is, you know, do you think you were wrong that, <laughs> that Ukraine <laughs> create all this blowback for cyber? I think it's, it's just more nuanced. I think, um, as most things are, I think that we are seeing maybe the limits of cyber war tested in real time. That's one thought I have. But I think that the horrors of what is happening on the ground in Mariupol, um, you know, with some of the, to me, just it's cringeworthy to read about some of the atrocities, human atrocities mm -hmm. that have happened, um, rapes, you know, forced migration. Yeah. Horrible, uh, stories, yeah. horrible stories. And those obviously are going to consume your bandwidth for attention um, in ways that code and cyber will never be able to compete unless you see you know, a big explosion or maybe a colonial pipeline. But when you look at the facts on the ground, we now know that actually Russia did, in fact, uh, a couple Ukrainian substations, power stations, uh, in you know, the weeks of the invasion. Now, they didn't turn off the power, but they could have. They could have 
turned off the power to millions of Ukrainians, but they didn't. And I suspect, and you know, I'd, I'd, you'd have to be a fly on Putin's wall to know why they didn't shut the power down, right? Yeah. But I suspect that if the reporting is accurate, that Russian intelligence uh, believed that Russia would have its puppet government installed in Kyiv in 48 to 72 hours, they wouldn't need to shut the power off. They'd only be sabotaging themselves, right? So they got in, they got the foothold, and then they waited until things weren't necessarily going their way to time the actual detonation, because we know it wasn't, they didn't time impact until April when it was clear things weren't going Russia's way. And thank God, uh, thanks to really what I would call unprecedented collaboration between uh, allies, government agencies, including CISA, um, the agency I now advise here in the United States, and the private sector, you know, private security companies on the ground, they discovered and were able to remediate this attack before Russia could turn the lights off. You know, similarly, Microsoft raised the flag uh, when they discovered wiper malware on critical Ukrainian banks and government agency systems and were able to help remediate before we saw the worst case scenario. Uh, similarly, we know that um, Russia, we believe, I think, I don't know if the, the attribution has been nailed, but um, hacked Viasat, you know, this satellite internet broadband provider, not just to Ukraine, but to Europe, and basically interrupted people's um, modem connections, that could have really swung the information war Russia's way if we hadn't been able to see these this incredible footage, uh, uh, you know, not just from news organizations, but from grandmothers' phones from their rooftops, sort of these Russian atrocities on the ground. But lo and behold, in came Starlink and Elon Musk. You know, we all probably have some strong feelings about Elon, but in this case, this was a really, um, I think, underappreciated <laughs> Elon moment. Yeah. He was contacted uh, actually by a Ukrainian CEO here in Silicon Valley who went to college with Zelensky uh, and was asked if he could do anything because Zelensky said, hey, we have five internet links in and out of the country and we believe Russia is going to bomb all of them, which they eventually, I believe, did. Can you help? And I think the quote I heard Elon say was something like, uh, oh, you know, you want me to help take out an authoritarian dictator? That's on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds Sounds fitting of the stereotype, you know, I don't know right, him personally, right. but, uh, you know, sounds right. in character. So they were able to mitigate, you know, just the internet going out, the power going out, all of their data being destroyed, but these things were attempted. Right. You know, these they just didn't make out. the, didn't make the titles because sadly there were far worse things from like a human interest perspective and, uh, and what people are, you know, looking to find out about that, uh, that were happening. Yeah. I mean, I think that the end, the last thing I'll say about Ukraine is we're not out of the woods. Yet. Yeah, you know, I think the more we tighten the screws on Russia with sanctions, with the uh, ban on Russian gas, uh, vodka, diamonds, um, you know, the more we explore this theory of do we ban visas, etc., the more likely it is that Putin will respond directly to the West. Uh, you know, so far it's all been a lot of just fear mongering and threats. But I think the most likely way to respond directly to the West is via cyber, you know, because until now, it really has been declared a short of war weapon. Yeah. We haven't seen anyone respond sort of in kind uh, to some of these egregious attacks like Colonial Pipeline or even the Ukrainian power outage that Russia did in 2015, 2016. So I think something will come of this, but I do have to say I've been surprised at and, and, and actually rather hopeful for the first time that we might be able to hack our way out of this with the kind of declassification that the U.S. government and our allies have been doing together in tandem with the real-time information sharing that has been happening. And I mean, Slack channels have been lighting up you know, for, a, yeah. for almost a year now, sharing what people are picking up on their networks. You know, basically, we're doing all the things about being critical and necessary, but never actually made progress yeah. on. And so we are not letting a good crisis go to go to waste. And I, I hope that it shields up, as Sissa calls it, just becomes the new normal. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you, I, I agree with you that it's a, it's a demonstration a bit of what could happen if you collaborate, not, not dissimilar to the sort of the COVID uh, kind of coming together of the scientific community there. 
um, to say, well, when there is some, some unity along with the caliber, along with the sort of capability, uh, you can actually thwart some, some pretty serious, uh, serious enemies for now, and, you know, that the job is not done, but thanks. This is super insightful, uh, on it. And, you know, I, I think, um, uh, yeah, you, you've rated well, but don't, don't let a good crisis kind of, uh, go to waste in, in the sense of, of understanding what happens, you know, this happened again, and how do we continue um, and to an extent, an acceleration of certain trends and drives for transparency and security and, and things like that, that you have actually mentioned in the book, uh, and they were sort of long-term trends. So this might have uh, sort of fueled, uh, fueled that fire. Uh, yeah, it's under- almost like the antidote to um, what happened during COVID. Like I was racing to finish my book during COVID and we were seeing a huge uptick in the frequency of attacks. And it was clear that adversaries, threat actors, cyber criminals, we're all um, exploiting remote work, you know, the rush to remote work. Um, it was clear that because this was a global pandemic, that we were leaving it to each nation to figure out how to respond. There was a lot of APT activity, um, you know, some from countries we had never, uh, you know, had never really crossed our desks uh, that were hacking each other just to figure out what everyone else was up to or how far they, along they were with vaccine development or what China knew wh- when they knew it when. So what I said in my book was something, it's been a while now, <laughs> something like, you know, this is, this, this is either going to be a learning lesson and we're going to adjust our defenses accordingly, or this is just a very, very um, small glimpse of the nightmare that will come. And I think Ukraine interestingly, is sort of the the more hopeful um, prism. You know, it's sort of like, here's a glimpse at what cyber defense and collaboration and threat sharing and declassification and partnering with our allies and having a unified response could look like in cyber. Here's the impact it could have. And we can't just let this kind of trickle out. We have to figure out how to keep it up and keep improving, keep iterating and keep yeah, sharing. Yeah, and you uh, you, you actually mentioned to me a conversation before this around actually seeing a bit of a dip in ransomware kind of payouts during like basically initially affiliated with the Ukraine war? Yeah, so it's really interesting. I, I think this data is still being collected, but Nozomi, which specializes in industrial control security, uh, where I'm now an advisor, shared with me that one of the things they're seeing is instead of ransomware, they're seeing just wiper malware. So that's one one data point. The other is that when what reported future and others who really are tracking ransomware have said is that there has been this sort of mysterious dip in ransomware attacks on the United States. And I know also TRM Labs, which tracks uh, blockchain intelligence and tracks ransomware payments, has is, is seen a big reset among some of the major Eastern European, let's say, ransomware groups that they've that they're, they're sort of rejiggering. And one theory here is that for a long time, we you know ransomware victims were just paying, right? They, the ransomware groups knew just what to charge. You know, it's, it's, it was always going to be cheaper than the cost of total remediation and the threat that your data was going to pop up online. So, so victims were paying for a long time. After the Russian invasion, general counsels had to say, hey, I don't know if we can pay this. I don't know where this ransomware group is based, but if there is an even minuscule chance that they are based in Russia, we would be in violation of sanctions by paying them right now. (laughs) We can't pay. And so we started seeing you know, some resistance pop up that I don't think ransomware groups expected or anticipated or, you know, uh, for a long time. a bit more uh, roundabout kind of uh, implication. Right. And and we also started seeing, you know, a pickup in ransomware against other countries in Latin America, for example. But there is an interesting question to be asked, which is, huh, you know, maybe actually this idea we should ban ransomware payments and just have a blanket policy has some legs as a, as a deterrent. And then, like I said, Nozomi said, you know, in some cases, they, there is no ransom. They're just wiping. So maybe these groups that would have charged you a ransom are just sort of giving you the middle finger and, yeah. uh, and just know, sort of to looking to attack and cause damage. Right. Um, Super, super interesting. Um, so we kind of veered, I think, a little bit, a little bit out. Although it's still all kind of impacts of vulnerabilities uh, and activities. Let's sort of maybe let spend the last stretch talking about what we can do about them. Uh, and so, 
you know, we talked about this a little bit. We talked about awareness coming in. You mentioned sort of the, the value of training and raising awareness inside the organization. When you think maybe like on two fronts, on one side, you know, from a, and on the other side, maybe more so from a DevSecOps uh, sort of development side, what do you, what do you think, or what do you, what have you sort of heard suggestions on that we should be, that we should be doing that we can do to, to change a bunch of these equations? Supply chain security is massive, maybe at the scale of like fake news in terms of its complexity. What, what can we do about that? So the first thing I'll say is we need our Steve Jobs of cybersecurity. We, we need someone to come in who makes this a lot easier <laughs> to be secure than it currently is, right? I'm out there talking all day long how it's about how it's inexcusable if you don't have MFA turned on on your email, on your financial accounts, on your social media accounts, Right. But then I have friends that I went to Princeton with who are, who are like, I, I've been trying for three days now to turn MFA on my Venmo account. And I'm sorry, I, it is, it, I can't figure it out. <laughs> I give yeah. up. That's ridiculous. If it's hard for my, you know, Ivy League educated friend who, who peripherally works in cybersecurity <laughs> to turn MFA on, on her Venmo account, then we are failing everyone as an industry. That's just ridiculous. I think we need a, a Steve, Steve Jobs of cybersecurity to make security as intuitive as the iPhone was when it was released. You no, know, it should be just as simple to turn on MFA as it is to you know, download an app on your on your iPhone. And right now it's a nightmare. And the stakes only get higher the longer you wait, right? So that's number one, is we need to attack this problem from a usability and design perspective. And I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> I think at the DevSecOps layer, we need to basically hand developers a grab bag of intuitive tools that give them no excuse not to use these tools as they're developing code, right? Like just... Oh, let me stop and just click on this button, almost like spell check. Like we need to actually, I've never said that before. We need a spell check for code. So there's a huge market opportunity there. The other thing we need is we need quantifiable risk metric. We need to know how much risk I'm taking on when I hire you or I bring in your software or I acquire you. And there's nothing. There's nothing like it. There's not, there's no FICO score for cybersecurity. Now, there are companies like BitSight who are looking at this problem and they are doing it from the outside, right? They're looking for anything they can from the outside, scanning your network, seeing if you have some server out there on the web that doesn't have MFA turned on or that they could potentially access as a hacker, that kind of thing. That is a really good start and we need to standardize that, right? But at some point, we need to figure out a new incentive model, hopefully not a regulation model, that incentivizes boards who want to know how risky they are, to want to know how much risk they are bringing to their customers and business partners when they work with them or when they you know, finally merge system. And there's just nothing like it. We have these sort of one-off piecemeal, mm -hmm. oh, maybe in this contract, we require you to get a pen test. Like it's not enough. And again, it's ridiculous. I mean, to do a basic bathroom remodel, right? At my house this, this year, I had to wait you know, several months, have an inspector come over and I was forced to move the toilet two inches and he wouldn't certify you know, our remodel plans until we agreed to move our toilet two inches because it created some risk for plumbing, right? Like it's, it's annoying. Okay. I hope we don't get to that level of regulation, yeah. but it's ridiculous that that's the level of effort I have to go to, to put some tile on my bathroom floor and do a new shower, but there's no equivalent when, you know, Verizon acquires Yahoo or uh, a company agrees to work with solar winds and give them blanket access essentially to their network. I mean, that is stupidity. It's just insanity. So we need standards. I think I, I really am pushing hard on this idea that, listen, as a capitalist society, we have to work with incentives. We have to figure out how to work with incentives because unfortunately, when you do regulations in the United States, number one, we have a terrible track record at creating comprehensive, nuanced cybersecurity legislation. Yeah. All you do is it's look at hard. the- It's hard. It's a complicated and fast-moving space. It's hard for legislation to kind of keep up to some exactly. of Exactly. 
But why can't we create tax breaks for companies that agree to get a real pen test, not a compliance guy come in with a checklist, but a real pen test and then show, okay, you don't need perfect security, but show, okay, over time between, you know, this time, this quarter and two quarters ago, I was able to minimize my attack surface by 30%. Great. You should get a tax break because your security is now your cyber security posture, especially if you're a water treatment plant or a solar winds or you know whatever you are. There's so many companies that really are critical infrastructure, United States critical infrastructure, global critical infrastructure. So we should be figuring out how to help secure them. And we haven't figured that out yet yeah. uh, on the regulation front. So I'm hoping we can figure it out. Uh, you know, as a as a form of incentive structure. Yeah, to do the uh, so it's in, first of all just kind of get back a little bit to the squiggly line because I'd be remiss to say 100% the line and in fact to an extent you know what we're sort of doing it's Nick literally we have a little squiggly line <laughs> yeah behind the code still a long way to go you know like and there's I a lot love to, that to work like you're writing the code and it's sort of like are you are you just literally like yeah side? technically I think it's had as you hit save but the auto save works as well you know the thing will uh will, oh, uh, yeah. will show you if you've sort of written a security mistake in the library. Or, or in your code. Um, I mean, I think some of the biggest advancements in cybersecurity are not the ones that the cybersecurity um, community general, generally thinks about. I think it's things like biometric facial recognition on your eye. I think it's things like when you're typing in a, a new password and it tells you it's weak medium or strong, right. you know, it's these basic things that make it, you know, that, that, that trigger that cortisol response where it's like, oh, I don't want a, a crappy password. I want, I want an A plus. Yeah. Um, to do the, uh, and, yeah. and we had um, uh, Adrian Ludwig on the podcast a while back and he's a CISO of Atlassian and he was commenting and says like, I don't want enterprise security. I want consumer security. Like I want yeah. my developers to get consumer grade security uh that uh that they're uh you know because in consumers you don't expect people to you know have a degree in how to sort of write secure code you expect the security control to be easy enough that anybody you know that your mom can handle it so i, I kind of feel bad for moms like they've become the uh <laughs> the uh the poster child of uh, maybe it's grandma maybe today it's also but your grandma yeah, can operate definitely grandmother uh, but uh, yeah. but I think uh, moms have enough that... on their plate. But that's kind of like it's it's an interesting point because yeah, like think of like the busiest person you know. It's probably a working mother or even just that's a stay at home mother or father, and they have so much on their plate. And they're like, uh, you know, when I see them at school drop off, they're like, ah, cybersecurity. Like, how do you live with yourself? Not exactly. Uh, you know, and it's like, well, you're the person that I we should be helping. <laughs> With the new executive order uh, from from Biden, you know, a, a decent amount of that is about transparency, right? You can argue useful or not, but for instance, it requires the software bill of materials to sort of pass on from vendor to uh, to, uh, to to the customer, alongside a whole bunch of other requirements. How do you how do you see that sort of playing uh, into the mix here? Do you think it moves the needle? Like, what's your what's your perception here? I just am so happy to have seen the word software bill of materials <laughs> in an executive <laughs> order, I was jumping up and down. I mean, listen, like I, you know, I, I now serve on this uh, CISA um, advisory committee. So some people will think this is a bias or a political bias, but I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have joined them if I didn't think that this administration was serious about cybersecurity. And that Biden cyber executive order is the most comprehensive uh, piece of cybersecurity policy, anything we have seen in this country. And frankly, I think it's a brilliant document because um, you know, software bill of materials, I'm just putting aside for a second, I apologize. But to me, the magic in it was this recognition that the government has limited purview uh, or authority when it comes to our cyber hygiene. And it recognizes that you know, that is a terrible place to be when 85% of our critical infrastructure is in private sector hands, right? Um, it's, it's completely backward. And so what the document did was it said, okay, we can't regulate this, right? We're going to be accused of being, you know, regulation hungry Democrats, right? If we, if we try and go crazy on this, what they did was they said, okay, here are the NIST standards. We will let you self-certify that you meet these NIST standards, okay? You don't even have to go to a third-party auditor. We're not gonna make you do the thing I had to do when I did my bathroom remodel by moving the toilet two inches. 
you can self-certify that you meet these NIST standards. Uh, but if we catch you lying to us and you are a federal contractor, you are banned from ever doing business with the federal government again. That is the first stick I have ever seen really in this space. And it has had a huge impact. So good on them for figuring out how to use essentially the power of the purse to say, hey, cut it out. You know, you can't accuse us of adding regulation here because we're letting you self-certify that you better meet these requirements if you want to do business with the biggest buyer out there, which is us. So, you know, hats off to them for that. I've been pleased, you know, I, I, I note this in the book, medical devices. There's been a lot of progress on medical devices on SBOM, on the software bill of materials. And I think that is where we have to go. We should know what open source code, you know, is baked into these systems that are so critical, like a pacemaker, which what software's in there. And then ideally back to my previous point about quantifiable risk metrics, what's the sort of um, risk score? of that software. I think that is you know, a nutrition chart basically for cybersecurity, I think is, is brilliant and it's amazing. We don't have it already and it's mm -hmm. going to be an ugly process to get there, but it, we absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I agree and it aligns well, if I sort of recap a little bit, you know, a lot of this does come back to, um, to, you know, the right incentive models and the right visibility, you know, a bit more interesting concept. I haven't heard of it, you know, sort of the tax credit, you know, it, I think aligns with talking about, it can't be all stick. It needs to be, there needs to be some carrot for sort of doing the right thing that is, so that carrot on one hand might be the tax incentive, but also it would be the ability to sell. I don't know, you can de debate whether that's a stick or a carrot, you know, it's a pretty big stick, you can sell there. Uh, but in general, kind of, you know, be more successful by touting your security certifications, security investments to, to sell more, but also raise and simplify that awareness uh, everywhere and increase the transparency with the hope that that mobilizes us to, uh, to act. Um, and I think just to sort of say that the uh, uh, team from Andient here and uh, I'm sort of name dropping a bunch of uh, ask guests, but, you know, team from Andient and uh, uh, Jeff from LinkedIn, you know, the CISOs there both commented on how they kind of expect public markets to also introduce things that are along the lines of sort of the generally acceptable accounting principle that happens sort of post Enron and sort of the fraud over there when it comes I to think security. I call that the digital Sarbanes-Oxley and it's coming. And my hope is that all of the people involved in that legislation will have read my book and really understand, have, have had at least a basic primer in the issues involved before they they send out that legislation because it could go terribly wrong or it could be exactly what we needed but yeah, I think, you know, we, we had almost too much hope, for instance, that cyber insurance would save us and it, it didn't, right? Yeah. It ended up being an enabler for ransomware because in too many cases, insurance companies were saying, oh, just pay the ransom. That's, that's going to be a lot cheaper than, than the other. So sometimes market solutions are not perfect and neither is, is regulation. So yeah, I mean, like I said, when I said, you know, among my target audience was Senator Klobuchar. It's like, yeah, someone who who is interested in this issue, who could potentially be a leader on this issue and has the capacity for nuanced policy thinking is is perfect. Some uh, some improvement. There's definitely raised awareness uh, in it. And, you know, we uh, continue to do our share and sort of see where it leads us. Nicole, huge thanks for uh, coming onto the show. Uh, you know, I encourage anybody to uh, find, you know, I assume your book is basically, you can find it on any on any one of the platforms <laughs> that you might expect. Really, uh, really really kind of a good read for uh, for awareness and for, for what it's worth also like a, an interesting you know a fun a fun read and great storytelling so I uh, recommend it but thanks for coming on and sharing more insights over here thank you guy I, I really have loved speaking with you and you know I'm always intimidated when I speak to someone at your technical caliber but when you start having these discussions, you realize um, the, there's just so much overlap and alignment in our thinking. And we come at this from such different perspectives. And, you know, this is one way out too. you know, having these conversations um, with people who are coming at the same problem from, from completely different areas. So I really appreciate you doing this. No, no, no. no. And I think, you know, the, and, and I think I mentioned this to you as well, which, you know, I believe that you, you kind of need to need to leave security to fix security. Like, you know, when you're in an echo chamber, when you look around, it's hard to see how things might might uh, might evolve or change. Uh, and so it's great to get your fresh perspective. And I think there's been much more alignment than misalignment in the views from inside. So thanks you and thank everybody for tuning in. And I hope you join us for the next one.